So last week I was introduced to a video that is actually starting to gain popularity um, as it relates to the Messiah potentially returning in the year 2030. If you have not seen that video, it is right here. It's about it's over two hours long. I personally made an hour and a half through it. I mean, I skipped a chunk in the middle, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But, um, and this is their part one, so that means they've got more information to give you. So I was going to go through this, and I'm going to let you know that it's faulty just on its basic argument. Uh, and um, I know that makes people mad. They come here, they get mad, and they tell me how mad they are because they just want somebody to just tickle their, their itching ears. And I'm sorry, I'm not the person for that. Go find somebody else that's going to tell you what you want to hear because I'm not that person. I'm here to tell you the truth. That's why it's something. You know, I take the time out of my busy day to do this. And so anyway, so in this video, they basically, so the first 30 minutes, I think they did a really good job because they point out that there is a 7,000 year timeline of human history. Uh, and it, this is something that goes back thousands of years that was taught. So it, this is not anything new. It's only been recently that certain church groups have decided that they're just going to dismiss that. And that's not a thing anymore. Um, but if we go and we look at history, then you'll find out that this was something certainly taught by the Jewish people because they go off of prophecy as pattern. So the pattern of uh, six days you'll work and the seventh day you'll rest, that goes, points out that we're going to, a day unto the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand. And they make the case, they make a good case for it. Actually, I'm surprised they didn't, they didn't go further on it because uh, they did point out um, that even people like Irenaeus and the Epistle of Barnabas also point out that there is a 6,000 year history and then a thousand year uh, millennial reign of Messiah. Uh, and so they go through all that. And they also point out that the sages expected the Messiah to show up on day four, at the end of day four. And for us Christians, that's true. Uh, from the, the timeline that I, I went back and started doing all the bagats and stuff like that, it came to somewhere around the year 3976, I think. Uh, now, that's not to say that there are not copyist errors or typos or something like that, and maybe somebody got a number wrong or something. That happens, and so maybe it's a little bit closer than that. But for the most part, that's the year that I came up with going back to Adam and bringing out to Yeshua. So as far as that goes, I was kind of surprised that they, because they made a lot of points that I've made where it talks about, you know, uh, the prophecy that if you, when God told Adam that if he sinned that he, that day he'd surely die and he clearly lived 930 years. So he didn't die in that particular day that he ate the forbidden fruit. No, it went out, but he died prior to the thousand years. So, so they make that point in there and I think they did. And the point, I was kind of surprised they didn't go as far as to explain the, the, um, the uh, phrase, you know, the last days. Because uh, we see that in Joel, where he says, In the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. And then Peter essentially quotes that on the day of Pentecost in Acts, where he says, this is what's actually taking place. These guys aren't drunk. This is God's spirit that's being poured out on these people. And we're now in the last days. That is the last days of a week. So if now we've gone transition from day four to day five, five, six, seven, that's the last days of the week. So anyway, they did a really good job of that. And I, and the only place that I have is they put the cross on the year 4,000. And we don't really have any proof of that. That's really an assumption. Like I said, if I do the, the timeline itself, then it came to the year 3976 um, or something like that. But say plus or minus five, 10 years, we, 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 don't, we don't know. So that's, again, probably why we're commanded to watch and not, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, as, as it relates to the 6,000 years, you can go back to the, the uh, Talmud and you can see where they taught it and they eventually documented it in here where he says 6,000 years is the duration of the world. So this is not a Christian thing. This is not a new thing that even exists. This goes way back into what was taught. Uh, and they had basically, uh, the quote Hosea here, after two days, he'll revive us on the third day, or uh, revive us and we will live in his presence. Uh, we go down here, they explain that there's 7,000 years. They talk about the Sabbath, um, 6,000 years of duration of the world, 2,000 of that are characterized by chaos, 2,000 is the law or Torah, and, uh, and then 2,000 years from uh, the period of the coming Messiah, and then we have one more. I found this article here. Uh, where they 
they showed the, the world that was, the world that is, and is to come, and all that kind of stuff. And they've got names for all this stuff. So again, this is not some Christian concoction or something that, you know, I, I guess I'm being uh, accused of being a dispensationalist. And so that's, this is, to just, to, you know, it's, I even argue with somebody, I said, you know, they, they've been breaking things up into ages for years. I don't understand. I don't think they really understand what they believe because I can't get them to admit what it really is that they believe. And it's just, they, it, it just comes down to the fact that they hate the rapture. It's not any of this other stuff. They just, oh, Darby invented it. Well, why am I able to read letters that Mr. Mead wrote in 1629 about the rapture of the saints and their translation into heaven if Darby invented it in 1830? I don't, I'm, I'm having trouble with that. So anyway, that part is that part is solid. That part is great. They did a good job on that. And then they got into a lot of fluff to uh, amplify something that they found in the Talmud. Now, what they are basically doing is they are saying, okay, the Talmud mentions that for the last remaining four decades, up until the point that the temple was destroyed, when it came to the scapegoat, they would put a, uh, a crimson thread in its horns and that thread would turn white as a miracle to show the nation of Israel that their sins were forgiven. Now, this is not something that's in the Bible is the first thing. I mean, the, the scapegoat is, but all the other uh, rituals and the miracles and stuff like that, that was never covered in the Bible itself. Now, this was something that did go on. But they have taken this out of context because they, they did not document this in the Talmud to prove that the Messiah came on 30 AD and then you got the last four decades where the thread didn't turn. And the assumption from these people that they're trying to make is simply that uh, since Yeshua is the atonement for our sins, that no longer did that scar scarlet thread turn. And so it proves that the cross happened in 30 AD. It actually doesn't. And the reason why is because, because they took out a context, we deal with the, so I'm going to back us up a little bit because it was in 39b that they said this, but we're dealing with 40 years of Simon the Just. Uh, he was high priest for 40 years. In his tenure, it, the, the, the crimson wool always, always turned white. After he passed away, about 300 years prior to the, uh, the destruction of the temple, it says then onward, sometimes it runs, sometimes it didn't, sometimes, and there was about four different miracles that were taking place. That's the menorah that would eventually go out. Prior to that, it didn't go out. But in, in then onward, sometimes it turned white, talking about the scapegoat and the, the scarlet thread, and then sometimes it didn't turn white. And this was, this was a slow decline for the remaining 300 years prior to the destruction of the temple. Um, so if we continue onward, uh, to, to, Right about here. Yep. So then they, this is what they're using. It said that 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple. So they're talking about the lot that would arise in the hands of the priest or the strip of crimson was tied to the head of the goat did not turn white. And the westernmost lamp did not burn continually. So they are using this right here to say, ah, see, that is proof that the Yeshua, the cross happened in 30 AD because 40 years from 30 AD is 70 AD. And there you go. So, but no, that's again, out of context. They didn't put it in there to prove that Yeshua was the Messiah. They put it in there just as a remark to say, yeah, it, off and on these miracles would happen. And then all of a sudden they stopped happening. And they document some other miracles that I wouldn't, well, maybe miracles, but like the, the doors to the temple would open on their own, uh, which to them was a sign that the temple was going to get destroyed. They, they knew that the temple was going to get destroyed and eventually it did. And you have to understand that when they documented this stuff a couple years, hundred years after the fact, they're kind of having to try to reinvent their religion because now we don't have the sacrifices, we don't have the temple, but what do you do with that? And so, um, so yeah, to me that, that, and so when they do the whole fluff stuff after that, you know, they make that remark and it's like, oh, wow, that's an interesting. And then they go and they start going through all these other parables and all this, the rest of the Bible to try to find like all these little things and tie them together. That was the point where I kind of dropped out and I was just like, yeah, no, that's not a thing. That's, that's plus if I've already taken the time to actually build this timeline that I did here where I'm using not only Josephus and Irenaeus and a few other places, but also the Bible itself, because we've got the prophecy in Daniel that uh, Messiah was cut off uh, in, at the 69th week. 
So if you go from the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, which is in Ezra 7, and it was, it was in the first month all that happened. So this was Artaxerxes' seventh year. Historically, we know exactly that's 457 BC. You go out 483 years, you come to 27 AD. So that three-year discrepancy was like, is this really a thing? And so I had to, I, I did a lot of research, you know, with their assumption. And then I had to take a second and, and say, wait a minute, what am I missing? Because there's an assumption here that's going on. And that's where I started going back and reading prior to that to see what was going on. Because I even went as far as Josephus to read, like the war started in 66 AD when they laid siege to, and started taking out all the cities uh, in, in Israel. And I was curious if maybe the times were kind of crazy. And so maybe they stopped doing um, the animal sacrifices, you know, in 67 AD. But no, Josephus remarks that the sacrifices were actually, they, they say, ceased sometime in the summer of 70 AD before the temple was destroyed. So, yeah, I, I'm hoping that that maybe will help you guys out if you watch the video and you get kind of pulled into it. One thing that they, uh, I, they didn't mention the rapture in this, this video, but the, those that do subscribe to the, uh, the rapture doctrine, they're going to take this video and run because say, even if a post tribber put this thing together and they're looking at it saying if the cross was in 30 AD, we go out 2000 years. Now we're in the year 2030. That's when Messiah comes. Well, all you got to do is just back off seven years. Guess what year that they're going to assume that the rapture is going to take place based off of their uh, work. So yeah. This is going to be one more thing that they're going to stick in there. And because of the amount of fluff that they put in it, I, this is going to be a, a huge letdown for a lot of people, most likely, because 2024 will come and nothing happened in 2023. And I mean, just saying that, I know I'm going to get angry comments like, why are you saying that? You're not building up the body. No, I'm telling you the truth. There's truth is a big deal when it comes to God. So yeah, there's a lot of things in the Bible to talk about, don't lie, don't do this, don't do that. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. And I'm sorry you don't like that. So um, yeah, I, I hope that helps you out. And when you, when you come across this information and um, I guess I'll see you in the next one. And for those that are interested in the hydroponic garden, uh, I have an update for you. So last week, those tomato plants right there were 22 inches tall, or that one specifically, and it's up to almost 30 inches. Uh, I actually have some fruit, we can see, oh, there, and there, and there. So yeah, that's doing pretty well. I also have some spaghetti squashes that are starting to come out, and these plants have gotten, I mean, that one's almost as tall as I am, so yeah. And then, yeah, the peppers are doing really well. So we'll see how quickly they, they grow. And if we come over here real fast. So the final setup of this uh, was originally this pump would cycle on, off, on, off for five minutes. And I figured that would probably wear out the, uh, the switch up there. So what I did was I added in this five gallon um, accumulator tank. So now that pump will run for 75 seconds, 80 seconds. Uh, so I, I have it set for like 90 seconds and then goes back to 60 minutes. So it runs and then it'll shut itself off when it finally gets this up to pressure, which is 30 PSI. And, uh, and then it takes about seven to 10 minutes for the whole thing to drain back down uh, and end up back on, on the plants. So a couple of benefits to growing like this that I've noticed so far is obviously they, they have all the nutrients they need, so they are growing like weeds. And a part of that is one of the problems I was having is the soil pH out here is a 10, and I would get calcium lockout a couple of times, and that uh, gives me blossom rot. Uh, so I won't have that problem as long as I keep the pH and the nutrients where they are needed to be. The other part of this is I'm only using four gallons a day when I had my four foot by 12 foot with the same amount of plants in there to keep the soil hydrated, I used 60 gallons of water per day during the summer. Uh, and then of course there's the benefit because I take all my nutrient solution and I toss it. And one of the places that I've been putting it is on this little ivy that I got, but I want you to notice the difference in size between that and one of the, the latest. <laughs> These are like eight inches long compared to that one's probably 
three. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I hope I've inspired you to maybe get into hydroponics, whether or not you just do it. At, like I said, I've got a couple of grow tents inside my house. I just grow or you go and do something that big. My friend asked me how big, how much that cost, and I said, well, um, I got a lot more money in my account now that I'm not buying stuff for it. So I don't remember. Maybe it was pricey. Anyway, y'all have a good one.